So this next video is how to do the random walk model. Uh, if you've noticed, I have the same file open as I did the runs test and the auto correlations test YouTube videos on. It's caterpillar.xls. It's in your data on share out, uh, in your lecture data. Okay, now, um, what I'm just going to recap from this data is that we did the runs test and we did the autocorrelations test on the closing prices for the Caterpillar stock. And uh, what ended up happening is that it failed the runs test and it failed the autocorrelations test. Um, and uh, the runs test p value, the reason it failed is because its runs test p value is way under 0 0.05 and it failed the autocorrelations because all first 11 legs were significant. That's a lot. Uh, now, uh, what we're going to do next, actually, is do the random walk model on it, and we're going to need to do a runs test and an auto correlations test on that um, for to run that method. Sorry, um, and um, the uh, difference with that though is actually a variable that we call the difference variable. So to do the random walk model, first thing we're going to do is we're going to create what's called a difference variable. We're going to take the difference between the first two data, sorry, those two, B5 minus B4, okay, and copy that the whole way down. And let's just check to see it didn't go too far. Good. And those are just the differences between the time step data. What we're looking to do, uh, we're assuming this data trends upwards. And also, actually, this method is good for meandering data that slowly trends upwards, but just kind of does a little random walk as it goes up. Um, now, um, that's the method we're going to use. Before we do this method, what we need to check uh, is are the differences random and is there any autocorrelation? So funny enough, the closing prices were very much not random and they were highly autocorrelated. The differences won't be. Okay, so make your difference column like we did here, taking the difference between uh, the first and second time step data and then copy that down. And then under add-ins, stat pro and statistical inference, do your runs test for randomness on those differences. Notice the first one needs to be blank, so you put in a star. Okay, click okay, select the differences, do it about the mean of the series, put it to the right of the data, and here are our results. A uh, little note here, this is good. This means that the differences are random. This is good and necessary. Okay, that's our first test we perform before we do the random walk me method. Uh, so next thing, second test we need to do under summary stats and auto correlations, we're going to do uh, the auto correlations test on this guy. For some reason, it didn't want to do it. Okay, I must have a window open here somewhere. Sorry, one second. Something else is open, I'm guessing. So let's grab, in this case, 18. Okay, that's my lazy way of figuring out how many. Good, put them to the right of the data, and there they are. If you'll notice, none of them are bolded. Okay, and if you'll notice down here, the AC on the differences, none of them are red. Okay, so that is good. So I'll put a little comment here. Note, none of the lags are significant. This is good for the random walk model. Okay, so now we are ready to start our random walk model. So we must do those two tests first. Well, first we must make the difference variable. Then we must do those two tests on the difference variable. It must pass both of those. So none of the lags can be significant and the uh, differences must be random. So this p-value must be over 0.05. Okay, now for the random walk model. 
Uh, the way to do that, you're just gonna get the average and the standard deviation of the difference. Quick way to do this under add-ins and stat pro. Um, under summary stats, let's just go get those summary stats, one variable summary stats on those differences. Oh, and go grab those guys. Click OK. Mean, median, and standard deviation is perfect. And let's put them to the right of the data as well. So there they are. Standard deviation is 3.851, and the mean is the 0.373. Now, what we're doing this for is to do some predictions later. So I'm going to go hide a bunch of these rows just to make it easier to see the top ones. So right click hide those. You don't have to do this. Um, but it's actually recommended. Okay, there we go. So that's where our data ends. Notice that there's a big jump in time here. Okay, because I hid a bunch of those um, rows. Okay, there we go. Now what we're looking to do is forecast into the future. Okay, um, so beyond April here, we've got May 2001. Okay, let's keep going here all the way through to September 2001. Good. Let's get some forecasts. So the way to forecast here for the random walk method, you take the last data that you had and you add on the um, average of the differences. That will give you an average upward trend. So there we go make this column larger so we can see what that number is. Okay, perfect. And then going forward from there, you can literally just take your previous forecast and uh, add your difference, your average of your differences to it again. So now with this guy, we can lock that guy. Okay, and then just copy that formula down. Our data we're assuming is trending upwards um, on average by uh, 0.373 per time step, but with a huge variation of 3.851. Okay, last thing to get once you've done your forecast is your errors. Okay, now these are kind of interesting. Um, so your error is equal to your standard deviation here. Lock that guy. Times by the square root of the number of time periods ahead you're going or forecasting. So I have April's data, so May is one time period ahead of that, so it's times by the square root of one. Now if I to keep going here, next guy, this guy here, uh, G8 is times by the square root now of two because I have up to April's data and I'm forecasting all the way to June, which is two time steps ahead. Uh, what you can also do is, um, just to make it a little bit quicker here, uh, there we go. Do this, so change our cell reference here. And then we can just copy this formula all the way down. Good. So just reference the one, two, and all the way to five. Okay, and copy that down, sorry, there we go. Sorry, getting there, double click on the bottom right, good. So those are our errors, notice they get much larger as we forecast into the future. The last thing we can do with that is build up our confidence interval for, the, for those errors, okay, or for our forecasts rather. So lower and upper 95, so we take our forecast and subtract two of our errors or standard errors if you will do that for each of the time steps. Our intervals are going to get wider and wider as we go and uh, take our forecast and add two of those errors for our upper 95% and then copy that the whole way down and now we have almost the forecast for each time step as well as the errors, as well as the confidence interval. So notice if we go all the way to September, our forecast is 51.736, but um, 
the error on that is 8.61, or if you will, the confidence interval for that forecast is telling us that with a 95% certainty, September's closing uh, Caterpillar stock value should be somewhere between $34.51 and $68.96, which is pretty much between almost anything. Um, so as you forecast further into the future, your forecasts get less and less precise.